Hello, everybody, and welcome to Adobe Live. My name is Flynn, and I'm here with fantastic Lillian Damono. Thank you so much for joining us again, Lillian. And, Hi, everyone. And we would like to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we are streaming and creating from today and pay our respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Um, and here, we, here we are. It's Thursday. We've almost made it through the week, Lillian. Um, lots of projects on, as we were chatting about before we went live. It's always the way. Um, but yeah, thank you everybody um, for joining us. Um, if you're watching over on YouTube, jump over to behance.net slash live. If you'd like to say hello, we'd love to hear from you. Um, let's play some music. And um, if you have any questions, we had lots of great questions on Tuesday. So this is part of a two-part series and we've carried some of those questions over. But if you have any as we're going along um, about freelancing, about illustration, about getting your work noticed, Lillian smashed a lot of those questions out of the park. So pressure's on. Um, <laughs> once again, um, yeah, so, so here we are. Um, but yeah, so this is part of a two-part series, Lillian. So maybe we'll kind of do a bit of a quick little recap on what we did yesterday. Um, or should we just pick up from what you did in the last sort of 10 minutes of yesterday that leads into today? Yeah, sure. So, uh, the previous session, I was trying to show people my workflow to try and speed things up when time is tight. So I would do some initial sketches, no longer on paper, but, uh, on the iPad on fresco, on fresco, just using the pixel brush to try and mimic, uh, pencil lines and sketch things out really roughly there. Uh, really handy to not be doing things on analog because there's always undo and options to erase or clear a canvas and start again and then from there taking the sketch into adobe illustrator on the ipad and um, just blocking in the vector shapes for the colors and then what i'll be doing today is taking you through uh, the actual um, illustrator file that was created on the ipad um, can people see my screen right now they can now yep yep so this file that you see here, all, all the shapes were created in Illustrator on the iPad and now I'm on the desktop uh, computer. I'll be, my left hand will be doing all the keyboard shortcuts, which is how I normally do things in Illustrator to speed things up. And then the right hand is drawing with my um, stylus pen on the Cintiq. Uh, I'm at home this time, like on Tuesday we talked about how sometimes I work from home, sometimes I work at the studio. Um, I have two Cintiq setups, uh, which is quite strange because I, once upon a time, you know, only recently, like maybe three years ago, I swore I will never be drawing on actual glass. Uh, right. And I've been surviving on my Intuos 3, which is, I think, 14 years old or something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> wow. But because... Uh, because the needs of being a parent whose child still needs them to be next to them in, in bed while they're asleep. Mm. That's how I first got into drawing on glass, drawing on actual surface. Uh, of and the, so that's the, like, talk, so the Cintiq is like, you know, kind of like an iPad, like for those that don't know. So like you're kind of drawing, um, drawing directly onto like the canvas. So where, where you're putting your, where you're putting your stylus is exactly where it's or relatively very close to where you want to draw, whereas some of the older, I guess, models were essentially like a peripheral device, right? Like it was replacing your mouse and it was over to the side. Correct. So you kind of be looking at your screen, but drawing kind of to the side. Yeah. So it's, it's a very different sort of brain to uh, brain to eye to hand sort of mapping. Uh, if you're using like a traditional non-screen uh, tablet device, uh, it's, you know, what, whatever you draw, down here is reflected up there on your computer screen. But uh, since I'm drawing things on the iPad using Fresco just for fun, um, that was actually what brought me onto this thing of drawing on actual uh, screens, um, which is something that once upon a time, like I said, I swore I will never do, but here I am. Um, <laughs> yeah. Funny how things kind of um, end up. So um, here, the previous file that I had before, uh, things were kind of like buggy and I, I can't really bring things forward and backward easily um, in Illustrator um, on the iPad. So that's what I'll be doing right now is uh, it's basically doing this uh, little trick where if I want this shape, this shape of hair to be in front of the head 
all I do basically is to select the head and then select the hair the hair that I want and then pressing command X to cut and then selecting the head again and then pressing command F which is a command for paste in place mm. so you're cutting something and pasting it exactly where it is in the canvas but just in a different uh, layer uh, sort of like stacking arrangement and that automatically puts the object that you are pasting on top of the object that you selected previously so same thing here if I want that hair to be in front of the blouse or the, uh, the torso I do that and then that arm if I want that to be say in front of the face that's what I did as well. Ah, interesting. But, so it yeah, depends I'll... on the object that you've selected. So it put, puts it mm. in place, but depending on which object selects, dictates the kind of the, the, the layer. stacking order. For, yeah. for so many years in my youth, when I was when I was designing, like I would just be I'd be selecting something. I think it's Command or Apple um, and the parentheses or something to forward and backward, and just keep pushing it further back or further forward and trying to get it right like that. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm doing sometimes. That's what I'm doing right now. Um, like if I'm doing like, you know, doing the square bracket, square left bracket is to send it backwards, square right bracket is to send it forward. Mm. And you press uh, com uh, command shift, uh, square bracket left, send it to the back. Yeah. Command square bracket right, send it to the front. But yeah, if you have multiple objects, it becomes really annoying. It's like where, what object is in front of what? So, uh, since discovering that little trick, um, it's made life so much easier for yeah, me. Yeah, it's very cool. So here I have the sketch. I might just bring it forward by making a new layer, putting it in front of everything, and then setting it on a transparency multiplier. So you can see what I'm trying to make there, locking it. And that's just so you can see the the sketch through the other layers. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. I mean, there's different ways of doing this. You can also kind of placing it into the Illustrator document as a template, um, which means that if you are in the outline mode, which is achieved by pressing Command Y. You can still see the sketch if that had been placed. I might just do it. Uh, so just go. See that there's like a template uh, checkbox that I can place. Mm. So you can still see this is something that I did for another project. Um, but you know, you can see switching back and uh, back and forth between uh, preview mode and you can see there outline mode or preview mode if mm. you place uh, an image like a pixel image um, as a template then it is automatically locked there and it would always be visible whether you are in a outline mode or preview mode oh great but that's not how I do things this time um, so we're just gonna continue on with that locking it uh, I'm just gonna delete that layer and then I'm gonna keep drawing the face and is the pencil tool like the most common tool that you will that you'll use at this stage uh... Yes, and the pen tool, but because ever since I've been drawing directly on screen, it's become more common than um, the pen tool, which is a very different way of creating shape mm. by drawing Bezier curves. Whereas if it's just the pencil tool, you just do that. And you can also set things so that um, There's these things where you can go close pass automatically when ends are within 15 pixels. So you don't end up with open pass like, oh, now she's got many eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So 
But what I do is because um, the thing with vector shapes is the more sort of anchor points you have, the less smooth the shape is. Normally what I'll do was once I've drawn it freehand with the pencil tool, I can also go to object path simplify. Mm. As you can see it's removed all the anchor points there and you can kind of like slide it like how many points the simpler the, to, the more to the left you slide it the simpler it is um, so that kind of helps simplify things a little bit mm. make sure there's no annoying little kinks That's very cool. Um, we promised that we'd answer some of the questions that came up yesterday that we didn't have time for. Um, and one of them was around um, why, um, let me find the actual question. Um, let's see, I'll get it word for word. Uh, here it is. What makes you choose vector-based, uh, uh, what makes you choose vector-based work over pixel? Um, and I think it was because for yesterday and for those that missed it, yesterday you were using Fresco um, and you were using the vector brushes and today you're in um, Adobe Illustrator, which of course is vector based as opposed to Photoshop, which is pixel based. Um, so yeah, so what makes you choose vector based artwork over pixel? Um, because my training uh, is as a designer, as a graphic designer rather than as an illustrator or a, I did not do like an illustration or a fine art course. So from the get go, it's always about answering the brief and giving the client what they want. So really with my personal career path, because most of the stuff I do end up being animated, uh, things that are generated in vector are much easier and simpler and cheaper to bring into animation. Mm. And um, with, you know, like with everything that's going on in the world, there's more and more screens and there's more and more messages that needs to be communicated. So. Uh, we saw a few years ago the rise of explainer videos where you use really simple vector styles uh, of illustration to communicate uh, messages from very simple to very complex messages. Um, and they can be done really cheaply, they can be done really quickly, and that sort of tend to be where uh, the majority of my work um, end up being. Um, yeah, because once you start doing animated pieces that are really layered and textured with a lot of like different brushes uh, things things get very very expensive quite quickly so that sort of animation projects they still exist but they don't come around as often mm. so I mean for me really um, I can still do a lot of things in vector but this is just what's in demand right now and you know as a designer that's that's kind of like my pathway of solving what client, giving what client wants and solving mm. their problems. So yeah. Yep. Hope that answers the question. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, also chat, I know there's a bunch of people that have joined since we started streaming as well. If you if you have any of your own questions, um, feel free to throw them in chat. And if you're watching on YouTube, jump over to behance.net slash live. That's the chat we are checking out today. We'd love to hear from you. Um, there was another question, rolling over questions mm -hmm. from um, from Tuesday's stream. Yep. Um, what advice would you give to creatives that want to be noticed by brands <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than studios or agencies? And I guess I'll throw in the caveat that is there a difference? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I feel like uh, these days Instagram's become like a really popular platform uh, to communicate directly with brands uh, mm -hmm. rather than studios or agencies, uh, you know, by doing the right pose, uh, doing the right hashtags, uh, TikTok as well. But because I'm old, I'm not really well versed in the lingo, not really well versed in that world. So if you are in your 20s or 30s, <laughs> Yeah, you probably are in a better position to know more about this or understand more about this or have more energy to really look into it than I do. But um, the only thing I can share with you is my experience with Adobe Fresco. Like I, when I first set up, I just simply saw Fresco as a, a new way to explore drawing um, freehand on iPad. 
um, and I saw Kyle Webster put a, uh, you know put up a few um, posts about that his own experimentation in fresco. So I started doing my own, and then I hashtagged it with Adobe Fresco on Instagram, and that caught the eye of um, Brooke Brooke Franceschi, who is the um, the lead designer of the product. I believe she's the lead designer of Fresco as a software, and and then we connected on Instagram chat started talking about different things you know she also has a kid um and one thing led to another so every time there is like some kind of event or an initiative from adobe like recently i was part of the ocean project where i had to lead a workshop um for adobe employees about how to design a poster that would be submitted to oh, celebrate cool. the ocean i didn't know about that decade. one that's cool yeah, so she put up my name forward for that, um, and I connected with uh, a completely different Adobe team than the one that you're from, Flynn. So, oh yeah, there's um, there's quite a few. <laughs> yeah, there's a few. It's a really big organization. So like you know, um, speaking of Adobe as a brand, it's like there's so many different departments. And Flynn and I actually met each other through my uh, agency, Jackie Winter. So you know. Having an agent that sort of opens doors and uh, are more in touch with what's going on in the marketing world of brands is also um, a good way to get noticed, um, I guess. But yeah, I guess it's a pure, pure game of luck and chance. Mm. Yeah, and it sounds like it's a lot about putting your work, your work out there and like your private work as well. Like a lot of that personal work has led to, um, you know, paid projects and client work and then that's led to something else and... There's no like silver bullet with it, but obviously if you didn't put your work out there in the first place, that chain reaction yeah. wouldn't wouldn't have happened. Yeah, I guess so. Um, but like, you know, when, when I did those things, I never set out to be noticed by Adobe. That's not my intention. Um, mm-hmm. I simply wanted people to know that there is an alternative to um, procreate. Again, I'm not bagging Procreate. It's just that it's it's personal preference. People don't find the interface, um, you know, mesh with how they think. So, you know, there's an alternative out there. Why not try it if you're already an Adobe subscriber? Yeah. Uh, I sound like I'm just mouthing off product endorsement and I've been coached for this session, but I'm not. <laughs> I, prom- I promise there was no discussion before this. About- no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, it's not, it's not a product endorsement type of thing, yeah. but you know, um, yeah, it's, it's really rewarding to be able to connect with the designer of the software and talk about it. And then, yeah. 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 Very and, I, and, and to each their own, right? Like, you know, there's, there's lots of software out there and find what gels for you and what works for you and your style and what your the kind of look you're going for and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. There was another question from Johanna. Um, will you ever get a TikTok, Lillian or Flynn? I'm gonna give. I'm gonna answer first um, that uh, I haven't. I haven't yet, and I don't think I will. But never say never. I, di- I wasn't on Instagram for like five years, um, and now it's probably the main way that I interact with designers and creatives because all the designers and creatives are there, right? Um, so that's yeah. why. That's why I'm there. Um, but before I was just. It was just mostly Twitter. Um, so who knows? Like I'll probably just follow where the where everybody else goes. Like you know. <laughs> so Lillian, you were shaking your head. Uh no. Uh, <laughs> unless I, I can only see one possible reason why I would get onto TikTok is when my kid gets old enough and I can spy on him um, <laughs> and what he's doing on TikTok. Yeah. You know, they get to a certain age and then you become older. You don't understand what they're saying or what they're on about, and following them on social media can. Um, be a helpful insight so if tiktok's still around in 10 years time when he's 14 yeah yeah sure, that's what that's what i remember that happening to facebook uh, when you know yeah. <laughs> all the parents jumped onto facebook all our parents yeah, yeah. i know so sweet so, yeah. mom don't follow me <laughs> getting into trouble um <laughs> yeah it's quite an interesting one with creatives um instagram has been talking i think they released a couple of of days ago that um moving away from being a photo sharing app and more of an entertainment um there's actually a really great video um from yeah. uh, pat k who's been on adobe live a bunch of times if you check out his youtube maybe johanna you could, you could find it his latest his latest last video was talking about that from a photographer's perspective about changing oh. it you know about changing it from 
primarily being a photo sharing app to being this entertain entertaining app. I'm doing a terrible job of explaining it. He does a fantastic job. So you should definitely check that out. Um, those in chat who are interested in that. Cause I think a lot of us use, yeah, use Instagram and share, share images and sta share static images um, or, you know, interact with people. So these changes actually have a really big impact on the creative mm. community. Yeah. Giving Johanna some homework. <laughs> She'll find it for sure. I think it's really interesting as well. I, I know some people talk about um, the fact that if you want to apply to a studio or whatnot, you know, your portfolio site, but like the actual website that you make is now no longer as relevant as before because uh, a lot of people just ask you for your either your Vimeo link if you're an animator uh, mm. or like your Instagram link. And um, yeah, it's very different. Yeah, I mean, I've seen, seen a lot of people kind of design their Instagram pages just around a little mini website, like with the, you know, the stories, like this is about me, this is my shop, this is upcoming events or something like that. It is really designed yeah. just like a mini website. Yeah. So coming back to the artwork, so you've put down the most of the flat colors and now these this is kind of the, mm -hmm. out, the outline is that right yeah no yeah. it's just about adding detail uh and i find this um a lot easier to do on desktop rather than on an ipad um because i'm using my left hand for the shortcuts and also you know like tweaking all these little um bezier handles it's a lot easier done on a computer, on a desktop, rather mm. than on, on an app. Why do you think? Why do you think that is? Is it the bigger screen, or is it the way it behaves, or the, the pen tool combination of all of that? Um, I think it's a combination of all of that. Uh, for me personally, it's also like what I'm used to, and the mm. fact that it's a bigger screen and how I sit uh, on a desk and where my elbows are uh, in mm. relation to where my hands are it allows for like a more precise um, movement and also this is kind of like this relates to what we were talking about on tuesday how um your body for me anyway your body really dictates what kind of output you will give so when i'm done with a lot of like desk bound work for the day uh and i need to come up with um ideas that are solving new problems i often find that they come out better when i'm relaxed mm. so i will sit in the couch in like a slouch on my ipad sort of like doodling like this like really low right um and like your body almost tells your brain what kind of thing what kind of task it is that you're um doing at the moment so whenever i have to solve anything difficult um i tend not to sit on a desk yeah so, that's interesting. Whereas this is more, this stage now is more like the craft, you mm. know. So you, I sit on a desk to to make sure it's kind of like you know everything is precise and. Yeah, I was well going to say yeah, going for pre precision and yeah, absolutely the, the craft the craft part of things, yeah. And do you usually have like a bit of an idea of where you're going with this? I remember, um, and for those that um, caught the stream on Tuesday. It was much, mm -hmm. it, there was an approach that was very free flowing. So you just started drawing and then um, you gave me a heart attack and you just deleted something that looked great <laughs> for me. And you're like, no, it's fine, whatever. You can just, just, you can just delete it or move on until you got to kind of somewhere you were, you were happy with and then you continued on from there. Um, yeah. But is this approach a little bit different in that you have a, a bit more of a plan? Like I'm just thinking about the accents you're adding here, like the pattern that you're putting on um, the top. Is that something that you mm. know about or is it? you know, something that you're just kind of coming up with on the fly? Uh, I'm kind of coming up with that on the fly. But um, in terms of if this were client work, then they would have seen the black and white sketches. Right. And they would have approved that first. So it's more of like a structured approach. Uh, and usually before the black and white sketches even got made, there will be a conversation between me and the client of what kind of person they see doing this. This could be an ad for a, um, a new real estate development. 
and they want to show a whole bunch of people enjoying a cafe lifestyle because you know it's all about the lifestyle and then we would have me and the client would have a conversation about what kind of demographic what kind of uh, outfits attitude gender ethnicity breakdown whether you want to show more like young families or is it more like trendy professionals or you know mm. so all of that has already been talked about and decided so at the sketch stage that's where a lot of those problems get solved and then this stage is just like okay like the little details that don't really affect those big uh, communication points so much like what they're wearing you know like if you say okay i want this person to be you know sort of like trendy but not uptight then right. you know my mind goes okay I, i will give them a floral top you know like a, a botanical print top mm. and it's also because i like drawing leaves and flowers <laughs> and plants so yeah. you know little things like that that don't really matter so much that i tend to just kind of do on the fly like this um also like you know doing this over and over and over again kind of helps speed up the process um a great deal but yeah hopefully that answers that question yeah cool um there was a question before around we were chatting about like your online presence i guess like as a catch more mm-hmm. kind of term um it's a question Would you say it is still worthwhile to have your own website? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Tricky one. I would say you can get away without it. Um, but if you're after big money, i.e. corporate clients, they still value the traditional way of doing things because right. then you think about what kind of people you need to convince that you can do the job and if it's corporate work that pays quite well or advertising work that pays quite well they are more likely to be older so they're less likely to be comfortable with um newer forms of displaying your work right uh like i know some big places still ask for a, a resume like really resume a pdf yes wow yes. yeah you just fax it to them Yes. <laughs> Fax it to them. Not trying to be ageist, but yeah, we were talking, mail. you know, yeah. It, but it is interesting. Yeah, I think that I think that's a really good point like thinking about who is going to see it because it might be fine amongst creatives we were just talking before about um well, I, I was mentioning that, you know, see people that basically just have everything on Instagram. That's awesome for like a younger audience because they're on their phone and check it out. They know how to navigate really easily and you know some of your stuff is in your stories they can you know put, they know how to pause it and go backwards and um you know follow links through you know things like linktree and stuff like that but yeah if your target audience that makes a lot of sense is you know so, you know someone in their 50s or even 60s you know working as a marketing manager for a big client they might say send me their website and you send them an instagram and they're like ah I'm not going to look at this this isn't serious what is this yeah enough. yeah exactly or even the CEO sometimes you have to try and convince the CEO mm. uh especially if it's something new you know like oh they've never considered illustration before and then you know you're in for a treat because you're trying to bring in someone that's not familiar with the medium or its potential and you know you're a believer uh so you're trying to win over a battle with somebody that's not familiar with mm. anything in your field so you can't take anything for granted um you know we were talking about freelancing and i mean you know i've i've been in the game for a long time and i feel like one of the things that really contribute to the longevity uh one has as a freelancer in the field is also communication skills and we talk about soft skills but you know saying please and saying thank you and knowing how to write yeah. an email well and signing off well and um following communication protocol is is you know just manners basically um treat someone the way you want to treat them in person uh, mm. on all your communications it really helps um and i feel like that's that's a dying art almost yeah so definitely notice the, e- the the email the email thing is in, is is very interesting um mm. i think a lot of people take that for granted um as someone who yeah. writes emails pretty much all day every day um, <laughs> <laughs> um also had a question from from anna great to see you anna um These colors are gorgeous. Do you find you drift towards certain palettes? Yep. 
depends on um, what what's currently uh, I'm in the mood for. Lately, I've been using a lot of blues. Um, maybe about eight or nine years ago, my blues tend to be more cyan-y. Mm. A lot of like pastels, uh, you know, cyans and, and pinks. And now it's more like ultramarine and sort of purpley blues and pinks. I guess it's also influenced by trends because to uh, wind down and relax, I like to surf Pinterest looking at beautiful uh, interior designs and architecture mm. uh, as well as fashion. And it's it's what, you know, what what's trendy. It's kind of like just seeps into your consciousness. Um, which is really useful because like you want your stuff to not feel dated, right? But um, yeah. yeah, that kind of informs what kind of color palette that I'm in the mood for. So yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. And color is always like a big question like here, especially when someone such as yourself kind of jumps on and just like very quickly like creates this really lovely <laughs> color palette um, seemingly from nothing. So it is interesting like the idea of you know, maybe not switching off, but like gathering something like a Pinterest board or a mood board or a collection of artwork that you really like, or, you know, whether it's design or, or outside of it. And then somehow that imprinting in your brain, in your subconscious, so that when you are, actually do get to creating, somehow it's you drift towards certain colors or certain harmonious colors. Yeah, absolutely. I think when I was younger, uh, definitely when I was in design school, I did not understand the value of going to art gallery or museum or you know even my lecturer saying oh go and look at um, wallpaper magazine it was all the rage back then mm. in, like uh, 99 2000 uh, in design universities and i'm like i'm a graphic design person why am i looking at wallpaper magazine which is all interior and architecture but i mean it's so ironic that now that i'm older that's what i i look at to get mm. inspiration and just to wind down and like architecture porn you know <laughs> yeah um and i think i think when i was younger i just did not understand the value of just browsing beautiful things for pleasure and then subconsciously absorbing inspiration that way mm. you know like it, it doesn't have to be from um design like if, you know like if you're a graphic design person it doesn't have to be graphic design stuff that you look at in fact i think like uh, some of the most inspiring things I find to look at are things that have nothing to do with illustration. Things like food, um, beautiful gardens, uh, mm. flowers. You know, I, I, I really like plants and um, gardening. So, yeah, like anything and, and everything can literally be a source of inspiration. A trip to the zoo. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all about kind of like giving your senses, your visual um senses a treat really and mm. textural as well you know tactile senses so, yeah that's cool i like it so we can go through pinterest and not feel guilty about spending hours at a time just selecting <laughs> houses house interiors that we could never afford <laughs> yeah that's my favorite pastime <laughs> <laughs> um so we'll keep rolling with the question so we have another one from johanna um, so do you use Pinterest for inspiration? I think you've answered that one. Um, mm -hmm. how do you balance the possible, the, the possible imposter syndrome and comparison that can happen from looking at others work? Mm. Uh, that's a good one because I feel like people who really care about their work would always feel like they're not good enough. So, uh, imposter syndrome can last, uh, you know, throughout your life and, Sometimes you just kind of have to accept that that's part and parcel of being a creative who still cares about their craft. And you manage it like the way you manage almost everything else, I guess, that's negative, uh, anxiety or depression or whatnot. You kind of like, you know, I, I personally meditate. Um, I breathe in, I acknowledge that it's there and then I don't judge myself for it. Sorry. And then, you know, I just uh, let go and try and move on. And it just gets easier the more you do it. Um, when I was an intern at like well, supposedly one of the best design places in um, Melbourne, I met the famous photographer John Gollings. Like he's an architectural photographer, and he's very, very good. He's just fantastic and a really nice guy as well. And his daughter told me that 
he still has imposter syndrome at the age of 55, even right. having collected all these awards and be a household name in the world of photography. He still has that insecurity. Um, mm. And he just wants to be liked by people. And it just makes me go, oh, I guess that kind of stays with you, you know, mm. um, and it's perfectly natural to have it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, yep, a couple people in chat. Great answer. Mindfulness, yes. Yeah, I think it is definitely, you know, these are things that we all deal with at varying, you know, varying degrees and different times and, um, you know, different intensities and it comes and goes. And, but uh, yeah, it's a great answer. Um, I did want to um, actually ask a question about yep. the work. I noticed you mm. built, built a perfect circle behind the elbow joint here. <laughs> yes. And I'd just like to find out more about why. Okay, so I'm pretending that I'm preparing this asset for animation. Uh, so it, this is a tip that uh, an animator from Israel, uh, his name is Daniel, he gave this tip to me when we were working together in London um, on possibly tight deadline for Google. And he said that this is the best way to do things and supply to animators is to have a perfect circle that is grouped with because like you as an animator you will that will be one of your important joints that will be your pivot point and then you you can animate this way and there's another one here where you animate that way so for example the elbow joint um you group one perfect circle with the forearm like this and then you kind of like just separate it into a different layer like i have there and then you copy that circle and you create a new layer and you go paste in place, which is command F. That's the trick you taught us at the beginning of the stream. Yeah, I think ages ago I went through this trick with, uh, with you, Finn. Uh, Finn. Um, and that becomes the group that is the, up, the upper arm. So basically for an animator, all they have to do is just to make sure that the two circles line up and then they can Right, so they've got these two invisible circles on top of each other. Right. Yeah. Wow. So you see that lines up. See? Very cool. So this is how to make your animators love you. If you're working with an animator. This is how to make an animator it. happy. <laughs> Yourself. Yeah. 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 That is just such a cool trick. Yeah. It's the thing I love the most about my life is that you never know who you're going to meet and what they will teach you. Yeah. So awesome. Are you finding that's a little bit harder now? Like, you know, obviously in the last kind of year and a half with everything, like working mostly... Yeah. Mostly from home and remotely, missing out on some yeah. of that. I feel like I feel yeah. like I'm missing out on some of that collaboration and yeah. learning from osmosis. Totally, absolutely. Also, like ever since becoming a parent, you know, your workday doesn't line up with most people. Mm. You know, uh, Eighty percent of the workforce works nine to five, and you work kind of like I don't know, ten to three thirty, and then back on at like five thirty or six or something. Yeah. Oh, for me, it's like eight till 10. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's like whatever works, right? And, you know, I've had so many conversations with other working parents. And once the kid goes to school, it's a different ball game. Then when they go to daycare, and yada, 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 blah, blah, blah. If the kid is sick, you have to take a time off. It's just, yeah. So, yeah, just a different life, I guess. Um, yep. It comes with its own benefits. Um Certainly, that's an aspect that I miss the most is working on site with other people. Maybe someday. Yeah. When uh, the child has left the nest and gone forge his own life, and I can come back to studios at the age of 60. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. I'll let, um, let you and everybody know we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, so if you have more questions mm -hmm. for Lillian as we're going along, now is your now is your chance. 
I like this jumper. The pattern. I know, right? Jumper. So cool. It's really cool. I wish it comes in my size. <laughs> Yeah, so often when you're supplying things for animators, then it just becomes like a game of what layer should go in front of what. You know, like here I'm trying to solve this problem with the forearm. Mm. Do you, do you switch to outlines quite a lot? Is that because it's getting a little bit more complicated? There's a few more layers and you're just trying to see exactly where things are? Yeah, I, I'm trying to, I was trying to find that particular pocket mm. shape that I have created to mask or, you know, to go on top of this hand. And usually it's very rare that when you have a, a character in this kind of pose and one of their hands is in their pocket it's very rare that you're required to animate it out right so this would most likely stay as as a static asset so that's not a problem to group that together so that's lower arm is a, it's its own group but then i have this weird bulgy thing that goes in front of the jumper so I have to try and manage that as well um, and possibly redraw this bit here. Probably putting that upper arm in front of everything. And then that needs to be redrawn and readjusted. Um, I had another question. This is an easy question to ask than answer, but certainly an awesome topic to chat with you about. Um, so there was a question, speaking of inclusion and diversity in your illustration mm -hmm. work, um, do you have any tips for creatives in having these conversations with clients and are they easier to have mm. now? They are definitely easier to have now than they were even three or four years ago. Um, but it's not always an easy thing to talk about especially if there is a pushback uh recently i found myself explaining um to a client why putting a person with a hijab is not giving preference to islam as a religion but rather acknowledging the fact that it's a cultural symbol and not just a religious symbol and mm. it is not giving preference to a particular group because that group is still facing danger of being vilified and facing violence and aggression in public spaces in Australia. Mm. So you're not actually giving preferential treatment. You're actually trying to um, increase their standing in the playing field so that it becomes more normalized, you know? Yeah. And the client just respectfully declined. So. Yeah, it's, wow. I think it's about finding a very tricky balance of being polite but firm. Yeah. And not, how do I put it, not aggressive in a mm. way. And it comes better with practice. I also feel like I'm better at it than I was when I was in my 20s and 30s. Right. Um, just being more patient and using the right language and knowing not to feel crushed or defeated if the client ends up saying no i mean the important thing is that you try you tried yeah, yeah exactly yeah. yeah yeah and maybe if it's multiple people that's like in, engaging with that client either internally or externally that's kind of constantly sort of bringing this up in a in a you know in a softer kind of way maybe eventually they'll come around right like yeah hopefully over yeah, time absolutely mm. over time yeah you gotta keep trying because uh, there's always going to be defeat, but uh, you just got to get back up there and, and try again. Mm. Yeah. I think some people want to buy the jumper. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever designed apparel? Have you ever designed anything to be printed, like for 
clothing, anything like that? Not yet, but not yet. That's really high on my list. I'm yeah, working it's starting. On it. It's starting now. Look at this. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. I'm working on it now. Um, I'm gonna be chatting with my reps at uh, Jackie Winter to try and strategize. Yeah. How to get there with their help on you know with their advice. But I would I would love to. I would yeah. love to one day. Be really cool. And that actually leads me to another question. We talk we've been talking a lot about um, you know doing the work for animations and things that live digitally. But what happens if a mm -hmm. client wants to print your work? Because I assume you're working in um, RGB because it's like very colorful work. Yes, I do work in RGB. Um, it depends on what the final output will be. I mean, usually it's a conversation that's worth having as early as possible in the process with people that will be responsible um, with printing and distributing to make sure that I know if I have to provide it in different specs, then I know beforehand, especially when it comes to resolution. Although if you work in Vector, that's not such a uh, pain in the butt, you know, but if you're working in Photoshop or in Pixels, suddenly being required to supply the artwork at 4K, uh, not just 4K, I mean, but like, you know, I don't know, um, 10,000 pixels across. It's like a big, it's a big ask if you haven't created it at that size mm. in the beginning. Um, but yeah, technicality, it's, it's always important to have the conversation sooner rather than later. Rights management wise, um, that sort of stuff usually is handled by the producers at Jackie Winter. Yeah. Um, there has been a time when, before I signed with them, that I had to negotiate my own um, contracts and licensing and stuff like that. And I was a member of the Association of Illustrators where they, like you pay like, I think at that time it was 150 pounds a year, which is okay. what do you maybe get about that? 300 bucks. You get unlimited pricing advice and hmm. a contract template. And like if it's a really tricky project and they want it, online as well as printed and whatnot um, you can ask for a phone call with one of their um, pricing advisors and talk through what the terms should be um, they are based in the uk but yeah like the membership is yeah you just basically have to make sure that you're available uk time to talk to yeah one of the people over there but it's it's such a useful organization i feel like it's it's worthwhile being a member if you're starting out and still trying to figure out how to license things properly and charge people properly yeah yeah and so you found that you found that really useful i hadn't I hadn't actually heard of that before that sounds like a really useful thing for lots of creatives like you know not for students because you don't have any money when you're a student right but like if yeah. you're just starting out that sounds like a good investment because that that is constantly the hardest thing i think for people is getting yeah. paid and pricing work pricing um, yeah so yeah i did find that really really useful i think i was a member for about a couple of years um and then you know like i, I that was a time when i got a lot of inquiries of like random things like different things it's not just um brochures but it can be i don't know um stickers uh yeah. Uh, collaterals and there's like all these different terms and different applications and different territories and you know because at that time I was living in London a lot of European clients come you know from Eastern Europe to like Western Europe from all over the, pla uh, the place and just kind of negotiating and getting the help and then after a couple of years um, all the pricing inquiries that I've submitted to them has become its own library of resource that right. I know how to price myself accordingly from then on. Mm. So it's really worthwhile, even if you just stick around for a couple of years. I mean, it's definitely more stressful without their help because then you have to extrapolate based on the data you've already had from previous inquiries, but it's better than not having any guides at all and you're just stumbling around in the dark. Totally. You know? So yeah. yeah, that was really useful. And I think, having that experience of managing my own stuff, my own IP before I signed on to Jackie Winter was very invaluable because then you can appreciate the work that the producers are doing for right. you. Yes. And also to, sh to know what a good illustration rep should be, like what, what they should be like and what they should do for you. Mm. Yeah. So. Oh, that's great. 
Yeah, it's really interesting. I wonder if there's something similar for, for like graphic design or motion design because that you said it was illustrators, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Maybe because yeah. illustrations that very is very freelance heavy. Maybe it warrants a its own sort of thing like that. Yeah, I think it's also about the uh, what people are used to. Like when it comes to motion design, I feel like people are not motion design and animation. People are not used to talking about uh, usage. Mm. Um, and in fact, the only thing that I feel has been a legit legitimate strict charge is when people when clients demand you hand over your project files like your after effects files mm. i feel like that is at least a 20 percent of the final bill like you have to put on top right just to cover the time and your ip because that's that's your work you know yeah. every single script and every single um you know uh, uh, uh technique you've employed in it is is yours and handing it over to someone else is like kind of handing over all your hard work yeah. um, for whatever it is that they want. And if they need to replace assets in it, they don't have to come to you anymore. I mean, that's part of the reasoning behind licensing with illustration is like people mm. want to use the illustration over and over again without having to come back to you for it because they're actually using the same stuff. So you should be compensated for work that should that would otherwise have come to you. Mm. Um, but I know with graphic design, like if you try and talk about it like that, and people would just be like, "You're crazy! You're out of mind! You're mind! You know, I'm, I'm not! I'm not paying extra." That's true. Yeah. That's true. And then when you come to the music industry, it's it's even more an acknowledged thing that uh, you know a song you pay you pay uh, a fee to license that song, be able to play that song in at your wedding or like an, on a TV show or whatnot. Mm. So yeah, it's it's all about what people are used to. But yeah, pricing guides is really useful i think in australia uh graphic designers can sign up to be members of agda and then i think that carries yeah. a certain amount of uh info and resources with a membership but i'm not sure yeah i absolutely i'm really aware of agda but not um not if they do the what you were talking about was like you can call someone up and they'll help you out with pricing and mm. i guess i assume like have a look at your particular situation and give you advice but i've never heard of that as um, something that Agda does. I could be wrong, but um, yeah, I have not heard that one before. Um, Lillian, this has been a great conversation. We've actually only got about two minutes left. Cool. Um, oh, that went quick. It, di it did. Um, but yeah, absolutely. Like, thank you so much for everything. Maybe we could just have a zoomed out. Yeah, perfect. Like final kind of look. Um, what we've done today, definitely the top has definitely been the winner <laughs> today. <laughs> um, that was super cool. Um, just like on Tuesday, like you, your your answers and the conversations we've been having, lots of people in chat saying really helpful, um, very useful, and absolutely like um, thank you so much for sharing your experience with us. Um, bits of advice says like I think if you missed Tuesday's session, you enjoyed some of the conversation we were having today. Definitely go check it out. Um, it's over on YouTube because um, it was much the same. There were, we covered a lot of areas around freelancing and um, you know all sorts of things like that. So thank you so much, Lily, and it's always a pleasure and we hope to have you back on Adobe Live sometime in the future. Awesome. If anyone has any sort of additional stuff, feel free to like email me or send me a message on Instagram. Uh, I'll do my best to answer um, individual questions if I can be of any help. That's very kind of you. Thank you so much again and thank you everybody in chat. Um, we'll be back um, same time, uh, back next week on Tuesday with uh, Ramez, Harry, Chris and Sammy. Um, that's going to be a great time. So thanks again, Lillian, and we'll see you next time. All right. Bye. Bye.